Hello, my name is Jerry Zachariasen. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about mutual funds. Mutual funds have been around for a long, long time, but there's still a lot of confusion around mutual funds. I find a lot of my clients view mutual funds as being high-risk investments. And the truth of the matter is that mutual funds can be very high risk or they can actually be low risk. What really matters is what it is that the mutual fund is investing in. Today, hopefully, I want to clear up a few misnomers about mutual funds, tell you a little bit about how they operate. So just think of this as, as just a condensed little view or a condensed little course about mutual funds and hopefully it'll help you to understand them a little bit better. One of the things that I like to do is basically map it out in kind of a simple picture form to give my clients a better grasp on what a mutual fund really is and what are some of the main features about mutual funds that you need to be aware of. One of the key features of mutual funds is that Whereas a single individual can't really afford to go out and hire a top-notch money manager, if you have thousands of people that are pooling their resources together, so that now instead of talking about thousands, we're talking about millions and perhaps even billions of dollars, suddenly you can see that you could afford to go out and hire the very best money manager out there. So that's one of the key features of mutual funds is the pooling of resources. I'm going to draw a little picture. So let's just think of the mutual fund as being a big sack of dollars. And with the mutual fund what you have is individual investors who are pooling their resources. So lots and lots of dollars coming into the fund to make up that overall investment. Now I'm going to represent the actual investment inside the mutual fund in the form of a rectangle. So let's just let that rectangle, rectangle represent the portfolio within the mutual fund. Now, within that portfolio, you're going to have many different investments because one of the other key features of a mutual fund is that you benefit from good diversification across numerous investments rather than holding one single, one single security or investment. So I'm just going to draw a few lines here to make some bands and each one of these bands represents an investment inside that mutual fund. But one of the key things that you can see here is that we didn't specify what type of investment it was. The type of investment is going to depend on the type of mutual fund it is. For example, if this was a money market fund, these individual investments might actually be just T-bills with different maturity dates. If it was, say, a Canadian equity fund, each band would represent a position of a stock within a Canadian company. And then, if it's a bond fund, each of those would be an individual bond. So you can see that what's inside depends on the fund. A popular type of fund here in Canada is actually a balanced fund. With a balanced fund, you're going to have a mix of stocks and bonds and even some T-bills within that investment. But one important concept to understand comes back to that question of diversification. And so when you as an investor actually invest your money into a mutual fund, what you're really doing, I'll do that little wider line, what you're really doing is you're carving off a slice of that mutual fund for yourself. And the thickness of that slice, if you will, is proportional to the amount of money that you put in. Key thing to understand here though is that 
regardless of how thin we make that slice, you've still got diversification across each and every one of the investments that that mutual fund holds. So the person who invests $1,000 is going to be just as well diversified and indeed will get the same investment return percentage as someone who invests $100,000. That way we can think of mutual funds as kind of a vehicle that levels the playing field and we find that smaller investors have the ability to participate in some of the same types of investments as high net worth investors. It's an important point to understand. Going forward, I'd like to talk a little bit about the actual structure of the mutual fund. One of the key things to know is that the assets that make up a mutual fund are always held inside a trust account. And there's a good reason for that. Assets that are held in trust don't become a part of the operating assets of the financial institution that holds that trust account. And because of that, you won't find that the failure of a single company or the failure of a single security will result in the loss of all of one's investment capital. Probably the best example of this that I can think of occurred in the 1980s right here in Edmonton when a company called Principal Trust got into financial difficulty and wound up going into receivership. It was ironic that people that were investing with Principal Trust perceived that their guaranteed investment certificates were the safest investments they had to offer. The mutual funds that they offered were perceived as being a higher risk investment, but ultimately when you invest in a GIC, what you're really doing is loaning your money to that financial institution. And it becomes a part of the operating assets of that financial institution. If that financial institution were to fail, there's a very real danger of your investments going down the tubes, really, along with that company. Let's think about that for a second. Because with a trust account, the assets that are being held in trust don't form a part of the operating assets of the company. And therefore, in the case of principal group, the mutual funds remained intact. Yes, they had to hire both a new trustee and a new manager, but the assets themselves were safe because the price stock never went down as a result of principal getting in trouble, nor did any of the other securities that they held. Just as a little side note, that's the reason why we need to be sure if we're investing in guaranteed investment certificates, or even if you're putting money into a savings account in a bank, it's important to make sure that those deposits are insured by the Canada Deposit Investment Corporation, or as we commonly call it, CDIC. So the CDIC really is the Canadian government backing your investment. So in the case of a CDIC insured GIC, the, the government basically guarantees that you will remain whole. They will make sure that you don't lose your capital even if the issuing financial institution fails. Principal trust was this kind of a strange situation because principal trust did indeed sell CDIC insured investments, but at the time they also had two offshoot companies which were small companies called First Investors and Associated Investors. Those two companies did not have CDIC coverage and ironically it's those companies whose GICs most people purchased because they offered a higher return. No free lunch in this world. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is and that certainly proved to be the case on the GICs issued by First Investors and Associated Investors. So sorry for that little side note, let's come back to the topic of the mutual funds. In my diagram here, you could think of the outside of, of our little money bag here as being the trust account. So keep in mind, regardless of the type of mutual fund, be it a money market fund, a balanced fund, or an equity fund, the assets that make up that fund are held inside 
a trust account. That trust account is controlled by a person we'll just call the trustee. And I'll just represent the trustee as this little box over here. Now, in addition to the trustee with a mutual fund, there is also a manager who's hired to look after the day-to-day -day decisions of what to buy, what to sell, and when to buy and sell it. So here's our manager. Now, you may well ask, well, what does the trustee actually do? And the truth is the trustee controls the purse strings of that mutual fund. So let's think of the purse strings as being the string that ties up that bag of money that we've drawn there. So in other words, if the manager wants to make a particular investment, that has to be communicated to the trustee of the mutual fund. The trustee, you could say vets that request to make sure that it's in line with what the mutual fund is allowed to invest in. So what you'll find is there's communication back and forth every day between the manager and the trustee. Sometimes I get asked the question, can I lose money investing in a mutual fund? And the answer is yes, you certainly can. Mutual funds invest in what are called marketable securities. That may be bonds or it may be stocks, it may be real estate, but all of those types of assets move up and down in value depending on what's happening with that particular market and the economic news of the day. So yes, it certainly is possible to lose money if you buy into a mutual fund uh, at one price and subsequently the, the investments that that fund is making go down in value causing the unit value of the mutual fund to decrease. If you sell that mutual fund at a unit value less than what you paid for it, uh, excluding how the dividends can affect this uh, from time to time, you certainly would uh, lose money in most scenarios. So that's something to keep in mind. But the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that mutual funds, the whole uh, complex of how a mutual fund operates is specifically designed so that the failure of a single company will never result in the loss of all of your capital. Sometimes I get asked, can I lose all of my money if I invest in a mutual fund? And the truthful answer is, yes, you can. But you can see that in that scenario, the companies that that fund is investing in or the bonds that the fund is investing in would all have to go to zero in order to lose all of the money you would invest in. But you can certainly lose money, not necessarily all of it, but a good chunk of it, if you happen to sell your mutual fund at a time when the, the market is down. So important point to keep in mind, but the one thing that uh, I do uh, want to stress is that the, str the strength of the mutual fund comes from the fact that the failure of a single company will not result in the loss of all of one's capital in the same way that it can happen if you're investing in, say, um, a single stock uh, that suddenly goes bankrupt or the company goes bankrupt and the value of the stock goes to zero. The diversification in the portfolio definitely helps provide some level of protection against a scenario where you would lose all of your money. Generally speaking, the lowest risk funds are money market funds and those ones tend to act just like savings accounts where you don't really have a variation in the day-to-day -day price. What does vary is the interest rate that they are earning. In the case of other mutual funds though, what you'll find is those that are investing in uh, fixed income vehicles, those things which generate interest like bonds, um, will tend to be lower risk than uh, investments that are investing into the common stock of a company. There's also preferred shares and they're risk-wise probably a little bit in between where bonds and common stocks fall. But bottom line is the amount of variability you can expect in a mutual fund depends on that fund's underlying investments. Another important thing that we need to know about mutual funds is the fact that all mutual funds have a management fee. So in our next segment, I'm going to try and explain a little bit more 
about that management fee and what those management fees are used to cover in terms of the costs. Now that we have a general understanding of what a mutual fund is, I'd like to go on a little bit further and explain how the mutual fund managers and how we as investment advisors get paid for the work that we do when we're working with mutual funds. There are a few little op different options uh, and there are some little differences between them. So I'd like to take the time to walk you through that so you have a better understanding. First of all, you need to know that all mutual funds have management fees. Whether that mutual fund is purchased through a bank or a trust company, through a broker or an independent investment advisor like myself, all mutual funds have management fees. And generally speaking, the amount of those management fees is going to depend on the type of mutual fund that it is. For example, a bond fund tends to have a lower management fee than does an equity fund, one that's investing in stocks. And part of the reason for that is that there's a lot more research required to do the due diligence on a fund that's investing in stocks than a fund that's investing in bonds. Both still require the manager to do their homework, but usually you'll find that it's more work to manage the stock-based fund than it is a fund that's investing only in bonds. So keep that in mind, we have the management fee. Now again, that fee is going to depend on what type of a fund it is. For a typical bond fund, let's just say for example that fee, I'll try and write this down a little bit lower where you can see it, that fee would be about one and a half percent per year. But percent of what? Well it's one and a half percent per year based on the asset value of the plan. In reality, the fund companies evaluate the value of the plan monthly. And so in this example, they would be actually charging one twelfth of the one and a half percent each month. Okay, so that's the, the, the management fee. But where does that management fee go? Well, what you'll find is that roughly one third of it is going to be going to compensate uh, the investment advisor and it's paid out as what's called a trailing service fee sometimes just called a trailer or a trailer fee so we could say this is a trailer or a, a trailing service fee and that's how we as investment advisors get paid for the work that we do on a fund that uh, is structured uh, in this fashion with what we call embedded service fees. There are other types of structures, I'll outline those a little later on. The remaining two-thirds, so this is going to the manager. And so that might be a company like Fidelity or Franklin Templeton or CI. Those are some of the, the names of managers of companies. And so in our example, that goes to them so that they can not only pay the individual his or her salary, who's doing the decisions, in truth, it's paying a whole team of, of advisors and analysts who do all the background work needed and all the due diligence to pick quality investments for the fund. So part of that, money goes to them. Another part of that money is going to cover things like office administration costs, the, the salaries of all their administrators and all of their support people who are there to answer questions when advisors or indeed individual investors have questions that they need answered. So overall you'll find that two-thirds of that cost is going to the manager and that would equate in our example here to 1% going to the manager and a half of 1% going to the actual investment advisor. Now, 
that's not the only way funds can be structured. The movement these days is actually a movement away from having embedded compensation and toward what are called F-class funds. With an F-class fund, this part doesn't exist and instead the advisor just bills the client separately a pre-negotiated fee, usually a similar amount, but it's something that's individually billed directly from the investment advisor to the client, rather than having the compensation embedded here and collected by the fund company who then distributes it out to the individual investment advisors. Well, now that you understand a bit more about the structure of mutual funds and the management fee of the mutual fund, I'd like to talk to you now a little bit about the different sales structures, the different ways that mutual funds are marketed to the public. So let's just cover that briefly. One of the most common types of mutual funds that are sold through bank branches are what are called no-load mutual funds. These are mutual funds that have no front-end acquisition fee associated with them, so no cost to put money in, and at the same time, no cost to take money out. So from that perspective, they're attractive. But please understand that even no load funds, even though the name says no load, those funds still do have a management fee associated with them. And that management fee is paid to the manager and instead of having trailing compensation going to an advisor, that management fee compensation that's left over actually goes to the bank and forms a part of their profits. So the first type then I'll just put down here is the no load fund. Just abbreviate it as NL for short, but standing for no load. The next type that I'd like to touch on is a type of mutual fund structure that's been around for a long, long time. In fact, mutual funds that were initially marketed by brokers and uh, licensed mutual fund advisors were quite often what we call front end load funds. That is a fund that has a front end commission or acquisition fee that has to be paid in order to invest in the fund. We just abbreviate it as FE for short. So, if you see a reference to an FE fund, you will know that that's just basically an abbreviation for front and load. Okay, now, in addition to front and load funds, another structure that's very common out there that we see a lot of times is something called a DSC fund standing for declining sales charge. Some people refer to them as declining redemption fee funds. But the technical term is DSC, declining sales charge. Now, with a DSC fund, there is no front end commission that's paid at the time the mutual fund is purchased, but there may be a redemption fee if you don't hold the investment for long enough. Most funds that are sold on a DSC basis have that redemption fee start at somewhere around five, maybe five and a half percent, and then decline down over the following seven years till finally after seven years has elapsed there is a zero fee. And there's a very good reason for that structure and it's related to the fact that DSC funds pay out uh, an upfront commission to the broker who sells the fund. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later but it's because the mutual fund company has to recoup the cost of that upfront commission that there is a declining sales charge. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute or two. So DSC funds, very common, you'll see that out there. And then in addition to that, you'll sometimes see what's called an LSC fund. And basically that stands for low, so low uh, sales charge. And these are similar to DSC funds, except that they pay a smaller 
upfront commission to the broker or advisor and by the same token the declining redemption fee gets to zero more quickly typically within two to three years instead of seven so we can think of that as being a low sales charge And then in addition to the LSC funds, there's another type of fund that's used in cases where there's a negotiated fee that's paid to the advisor. And this type of a fund is called an F-class fund. Um, with an F-class fund, there is no embedded compensation for the broker or investment advisor. Their compensation is negotiated directly with the client separately. So the F-class basically is a fund that's going to have a lower management fee due to the fact that there is no embedded compensation in it, but that compensation is paid separately. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of clarification on some of the sales, more common sales structures out there for mutual funds. And what you'll tend to find with the, the FE funds is that Commonly, they get used uh, in a way that uh, they look very much like no load funds. Because with an FE fund, that's this one here, with an FE fund, that front end commission is negotiable with the advisor. And so quite often these days, advisors just say, well, we're going to set that front end acquisition fee at zero. And of course, when it's set at zero, then there is no cost to put money into the fund or take money out of the fund. So it looks a lot like a no load fund. Although if you were to look at your statement once that fund is purchased, it probably has a little FE behind the name denoting that it is in fact a front end load fund. I should have mentioned earlier that you will commonly see these abbreviations on the statements that you receive. So now hopefully you'll have a little bit better understanding of what those abbreviations mean. In this segment of the video, I'm going to try to explain to you how a DSC uh, structure works in a little bit more detail so that you can gain an understanding of how and why the fund company can afford to let that declining redemption fee eventually go to zero. So just to review a little bit, with this structure again, here is our annual management fee and this part, roughly one third of it, is a trailing service fee that's normally paid out and then this part is the actual portion of the management fee that's going to be paid um, directly to the company that's managing the money. So keep in mind that that management fee is charged annually. So each year there's a management fee that has to be paid and each year your advisor would receive their share of that management fee in the form of a trailing service fee. With a DSC structure, there's a little bit of a difference because with that declining sales charge structure, the advisor actually gets paid an upfront commission even though that doesn't come out of the amount that the investor has invested and has put to work. There is a, a way of outlining this to think that here you've got an upfront compensation. So the advisor, I've just represented in this A, is going to receive upfront a lump sum that is 5% of whatever the invested amount is. So with that DSC, in the example I've used here, which was for uh, CI Global Fund, that particular fund would pay a 5% upfront commission if it was purchased on a DSC basis. So you may well ask where does that commission come from? Well the bottom line is the fund company has had to reach into their pockets and actually grab some money that they've built up in order to pay that commission out. In turn the way that they recoup that commission is 
by paying initially at least a lower trailing service fee. So in the case of a DSC fund, what you'll find is that we can take our service fee here and divide it in half so that the actual trailer that the advisor would the actual trailer that the advisor would receive in this instance is only half the amount that they would normally receive and for the first 7 years the fund company actually receives the other half and that other half that they're receiving is for them to recoup the 5% commission that they've paid out on an upfront basis. So the next question of course is, well what happens if you as the investor decide I'm not going to hang around, I'm not going to stay invested in this fund for seven years. So if you just moved out, you might think well the fund company is going to be left holding the bag so to speak for the commission that they've paid out for the advisor. To protect themselves from that sort of a scenario, the fund companies devise the declining redemption fee. So yes, they're gradually going to recoup the upfront commission they've paid out over time by paying out only half of the normal trailer amount. But the way they protect themselves, if, if you as an investor cash out after say only one or two years, is they have this declining redemption fee structure. So with this structure, you as the investor wind up paying a fee that reimburses the money manager for the commission that they've paid out to the advisor on an upfront basis. The amount of the fee that you pay depends on how long you've held the fund. In this example that we use for CI Global Fund, the redemption fee if you cash out the same year or within 12 months of doing the actual investment, they're going to charge a redemption fee that's actually 5.5%, a little bit greater than the actual amount of commission that they paid out to the, uh, to the broker or advisor uh, that sold the fund in the first place. Year two, that drops to 5%. Year three, it still stays at 5%. You might think that logic would suggest that if you're taking half of the normal compensation here, that this would drop by a half a percent per year, because in the case of CI Global, this trailing service fee is actually 1%. But it doesn't decline evenly. It's 5% for the second year, 5% for the third year, then if you were to cash out in year four, the redemption fee is 4%. In year five, it's still 4%. In year six, it's 3%. In year seven, 2%. And then if you cash out after having been invested for seven years, that redemption fee drops down to zero. So by this time, the actual manager has recovered the cost of the commission that they've paid out up front. And depending on the company, what they'll quite often do is an automatic transaction where they will then start to pay the full trailer back to the advisor at that stage. In some cases that's automatic, in some cases um, it might mean um, the advisor would discuss with you the possibility if it's a, a tax sheltered investment of rolling the fund over to the FE so that the advisor at that stage could in fact receive their full trailing commission. Important to understand here that whether this part of the commission is going to the fund company or the advisor, it doesn't change what the management fee is that the actual client is paying. So in this example, I'll just refer to the, the fund facts for this particular fund and uh, we can see that the actual um, management expense ratio on this fund is 2.45%. So that doesn't change uh, year over year. That would remain the same whether this part of the commission is all going to the advisor or whether half of it is going to the advisor and the other half going to the manager to compensate for the DSC charge. So it is a little bit confusing. Hopefully this helps you to make a little bit more sense out of it, but 
If you have additional questions, please pick up the phone, give us a call. Our number here is 780-988-6564 and I'd be happy to chat with you further about it or happy to set up a meeting where you could come into our office and we could explain it in greater detail. Hopefully that gives you a little bit better handle on it. Thanks for your attention and have a great day.